So tomorrow begins the season of Lent. And as you likely know, Lent is a six week long session of season, excuse me, season of reflection, fasting, and repentance that culminates in celebration. Lent is 40 days long, not counting Sundays, to echo the number of days that Jesus spent in the wilderness fasting and facing temptations. It's fitting that the creators of the Revised Common Lectionary chose this passage from Luke as the gospel passage for the this year's first Sunday of Lent. Um, ancient Jewish people would have understood the significance of being led into the wilderness by the spirit. The Hebrew word for wilderness, midbar, occurs 271 times in the Hebrew Bible. So it's a pretty important biblical theme and one worth pondering again and again. In the Hebrew Bible, the wilderness is a place for intense experiences where God shows up. Extreme hunger and thirst where manna, quail, and water from a rock are provided. Of danger where Hagar and Ishmael experience divine deliverance. Of isolation where Elijah experienced consolation. The list could go on and on and on. In Exodus, God led the people into the wilderness to teach them how to become God's people. In our gospel text today, God's spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to help Jesus wrestle with his demons and help him process what kind of Messiah he was going to become. Jesus's time in the wilderness echoes Adam and Eve in the garden with the snake presenting very plausible lies about God, God's purposes and God's instructions. Adam and Eve fall short when they are tested. Jesus does not. So there's much about this wilderness story for us to ponder. So let's go ahead and jump into the text. Um, but before I read the passage for the first time, I'm going to light my candle to, um, as a symbol of God's presence with us to here today. And if you have a candle, I welcome, I invite you to light yours as well. May we be open to the graces of this Lenten se season. Luke 1, 1 to, excuse me, Luke 4, 1 to 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you, I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, 
it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. The word of the Lord. So before I guide you through the passage with questions and pauses, let's take a couple of centering breaths, breathing in God's spirit and breathing out anything that distracts you from being in the presence of God. May we be open to the graces of this Lenten season. I invite you to enter the story. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Imagine Jesus, who has just experienced the veil of heaven open at his baptism and heard the voice of God say, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Imagine what he is feeling as the spirit leads him into the wilderness. While he is there, do you suppose Jesus is tempted to feel isolated and alone? Look around you, what does the wilderness look like? What colors do you see? Do you see any trees? Are they bearing fruit? Do you see any animals? Take a deep breath. What do you smell? During these 40 days, where and when does Jesus sleep? What does he do during his waking hours? How does he pray? What does he hope for? Jesus ate nothing at all during those days. And when they were over, he was famished. Place your hand over your stomach and imagine the pangs of hunger Jesus feels in his stomach during these days. If 
Feel your throat and swallow. Imagine no food traveling down your esophagus for nearly a month and a half. Does your mouth water as you dream of tasting figs and olives and bread? How might Jesus' muscles feel after 40 days of no fuel? What might he be learning about himself as he fasts from physical food? What emotions do you imagine he may be experiencing? His only companions are his own thoughts, the spirit, and the devil who tempts him. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Bread, the staff of life. Imagine an intense desire to break this fast for the pleasure of a freshly prepared loaf of bread. Smell the aroma of what that rock would become if only Jesus would say the word. Imagine the texture of the hard rock becoming a soft loaf of goodness that could be raised to heaven, blessed, broken, and eaten alone. Imagine how the bread would taste if there was no one to share it with. Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. But Jesus is not by himself. He's not really alone. He is full of the Holy Spirit. And with his response to the devil, Jesus draws on the wilderness experience of his ancestors who wandered for 40 years in the wilderness so that Yahweh might humble them, testing them to know what was in their heart, to see whether they would keep God's commandments. How might Jesus' body, mind, and soul be nourished by remembering these ancestors who cried out to Yahweh with their desire for bread? How might they help him stand rock solid on his calling from God? Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. Look out at the kingdoms of the world. Do you see glitter and gold? Are your thoughts pulled to power and fame? Look at Jesus. What expression is on his face? And the devil said to him, to you, I will give their glory and all this authority for it has been given over to me and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. 
what internal anguish might Jesus be experiencing as he ponders this proposal? At this point, does Jesus know that his path to glory and authority will be incredibly difficult through humble service and sacrifice? What do you imagine is going through Jesus's mind as he formulates a response? How long does it take him to speak? Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Again, Jesus does not argue with his tempter. He simply remembers Moses giving the people the Shema, the greatest commandment and the counsel that follows. Jesus does not forget the Lord who brought his ancestors out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is Yahweh alone who he must worship and serve. As Jesus speaks these words to his tempter, what is his body posture? Does he lift his face to heaven as he speaks or stare into the eyes of the devil or keep his eyes fixed on the kingdoms of the world? Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. As you stand on the top of the temple, on the top of Mount Moriah, the mountain of seeing, look down 450 feet to the ground. What are you thinking? Do you feel a stirring in the pit of your stomach? Imagine throwing yourself off the building and being rescued by the hands of angels. How tempting is it to test God in this way? Jesus answered him, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, Jesus does not argue with his tempter. Rather, he remembers the story of his people. How Moses exhorted the people not to test the Lord as they did when they demanded water in the wilderness. In Jesus' own wilderness experience, a place where he is faced with questions, fears, doubts, and temptations. He finds comfort and strength remembering the story of his people. And he draws on the power and resilience of the spirit that fills him. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. As you watch the devil leave, 
Take a deep breath. Look at Jesus. What is his countenance as he considers the testing he just encountered and overcame? Does he appear ready to leave the wilderness so that he can bring the good news to the people? So now I invite you to spend the next 10 minutes in a colloquy, a conversation with the divine. Speak with God about what you experienced during this contemplation, especially the parts of the story that caused you to experience strong emotions, the parts that gave you great joy or left you feeling uneasy. What might God want to say to you about your life as it relates to this story? If you are a journaler, feel free to journal your conversation. Uh, perhaps you want to read through the scripture again on your own, paying attention to what you're drawn to. Um, if you're doing this contemplation later with the recording, Go ahead and hit pause now so that you can spend as much time in silent contemplation as you feel you need. Then restart the video when you are ready to hear the closing reading. When I sound my chimes, this will indicate that you have one minute to wrap up your colloquy after which time I will end the silence with this week's psalm. I will close our time of silence with this week's psalm. Psalm 91, one to two and nine to 16. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. No scourge come near your tent. For God will command God's angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You who tread on the lion and on the adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Amen.